So yeah, yeah. Thanks all, and thanks. Uh, this will be, as Ola said, will be a, a, a one-hour talk, and in two parts with uh, my co-author uh, Vera here in front. I will do the first half and give an overview of the topic. We will go into uh, into some more um, uh, exciting topics a bit more more deeply. And uh, so, I would like to thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity. It's, it was a pleasure to be here. It's a special uh, pleasure to give talk here, a talk here, also to attend workshops in general. And so, let me also acknowledge our third author, Federica Cecchetto, and. Uh, and so let's start. So we'll talk about connectivity augmentation. And so it's a bit of a, uh, could be a bit of a technical result I'm going to explain, but actually, so what I will do is I will just give a high level overview of the result itself and uh, kind of we'll sweep all the technicalities under the rug, but I'll try to highlight what we, what we use and where you can, uh, what you should expect if you want to dig deeper. And as I said, then Vera will do some of the cool stuff, that, uh, the cool technical stuff. Okay, let's start. So for those uh, of you who attended the summer school, I mean, the, some of the very first slide will be a repetition, but I hope it will then it should nicely connect to what comes later. So what is the connectivity augmentation problem? So you're given a graph and uh, you want to increase its edge connectivity by precisely one unit. So this graph here, for example, is, uh, is a three edge connector graph. And let me just highlight one of the min cuts. Um, so that should be a three cut, I guess, this one here, for example, or another one would be the singleton cut here. And, uh, and so how do we want to increase the edge connectivity? We can add edges to the graph among uh, a set of, of options, so, so those red dashed edges you see here. And we call them links just to distinguish them from the edges that are already in the graph up front. And so you have to, so what is, again, what is formally your task? Your task is to find a minimum number of links, so of the red ones, such that if you add them to your graph, you get, a, in this case, a four edge connector graph. So maybe... Uh, let me just try to give you a potential a solution. And then actually um, didn't think too much about it. I hope I do it right, but I probably just take uh, enough links to be in a safe site. Um, so, so this may be a solution. It may look like, so this I probably should also cover that cut here, right? And of course I need to, to essentially by Menger theorem, increasing the, the edge connectivity is really the same as just increasing the, the min cut by one unit. So I have to cross, you can rephrase this, uh, the, the problem as try to, to cross every min cut with a minimum number of, uh, of links. And I'm pretty sure I need one more. Let's try this one. Oh, there's a degree three vertex here. Yeah, let's take one more. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that suggestion. <laughs> I hope I don't have to take all of them because it would kind of defeat the, the whole point of, of the example, I guess. But, um, uh, but I feel reasonably comfortable this may be a solution. Um, or not yet, Vera seems to have a complaint now that that disappeared. Um, very good, perfect. So let's, uh, yeah. So let's um, uh, uh, let's think of this as being a solution. Mm -hmm. So uh, so this is one way to to do it. And again, um, uh, you see, I mean, even just checking. So probably the way, um, I mean, a nice way to check it here would have been to just indicate all min cuts and see whether I cross all of them. That would have been one way to do it, uh, also visually. Um, but I think you got the idea. Uh, fair enough. So, so what's important to know is that actually this general problem of connectivity augmentation, maybe first I should say, so I will talk about the unweighted version. So really, you just try to find a minimum number of links. There's also a weighted counterpart where you want to have cost on the links. You want to minimize the cost of the links you pick to increase the edge connectivity. But here it's just the unweighted version. And so actually that one reduces in its full general form to what people call cactus augmentation. That's just the same problem. The only difference is that the underlying graph is uh, a cactus. So maybe I should use uh, this pointer here that people over Zoom can also see what I'm, I'm pointing to. And um, so, so what's a cactus? Uh, oh, please, question. Could I ask if the problem is So I got the question uh, whether the problem is easier if the set of links is everything and the answer is yes. Then actually it's polynomial time solvable indeed. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Uh, thanks for the question. So cactus augmentation. Um, so again, what is a cactus? A cactus is a, um, it is, I think there's like two definitions people use in the literature, but here it's, it's a connected graph where every edge is in precisely one cycle. And um, uh, so you can think of it as, you see the example up here, you can think of it as uh, you have a tree and you replace the edges by cycles. It's kind of a loose way to think about it. So, so why, maybe you wonder why is it equivalent to cactus augmentation? And this just linked to what I said before that, that the problem is really just about, about hitting all those min cuts. And it turns out they're very well known, very well established results about the structure of min cuts in graphs. 
And actually for any graph, it turns out that the min cuts can be represented by the two cuts of a cactus. So essentially give me any graph like the graph here. I can give you another, I can give you a cactus such that every min, that the min cuts you have over here, each min cut here corresponds to a min cut over here and, uh, and also vice versa. There can be, it's not one-to-one -one in a sense, this could be that a min cut here corresponds to more than one min cut over here. This, could, this can happen, but important is that the cactus represents all of the main cuts of the original graph. And therefore you can just try to hit the main cuts of that graph instead of the original graph. So whenever you think about conflict augmentation, we can think about cactus augmentation, it's the same. Please. Does this reduction work for the case? Yes, it also works for the weighted case, exactly, yeah. So it's also an, an important point here in this, in this overview talk I gave is a, um, it turns out we can reduce the problem and maybe reduce it once more to an even simpler case, at least the, the unweighted version. And it's, I think it's really important to, uh, I think it's important to keep that in mind. It simplifies a lot of things if you think about the, the special case and the, instead of the original one. And um, also one, one thing I should mention is that, so we said we are gonna increase the edge connectivity, let's say from K to K plus one. So it turns out that the, the, the game becomes significantly easier if K is odd. So if your graph is, is K edge connected for, for an odd K, then, then it turns out that the structure of the min cuts are even simpler than, than, than a cactus. You don't need a cactus representation, but actually the min cuts even from a laminar family, in which case the problem just reduces to what people call tree augmentation. So the underlying graph is a tree and you wanna cover all of those cuts. So here's tree augmentation is super nice, although I wouldn't have spent that much time convincing you that a solution is a, is a solution in tree augmentation because the min cuts are simply correspond to the edges of the tree, right? Uh, so it's much easier to think about, about min cuts here. So there's been a lot of work. What's maybe good to know is that the getting a two approximation is, is quite easy, at least easy from with the tools we know nowadays. There's many procedures that, that classical procedures that give two approximations, even for the weighted setting of those problems. And so the, the, um, uh, the main goal was to beat this factor of two. And this has started with, um, uh, with TAP first, and there's been a, a bunch of very interesting papers, and then the, which, which now went, went down to a factor of an approximation factor of slightly below 1.5. And so that is based, there's been a, a quite a variety of different techniques people use in that context. And so that last factor here is based on, on, uh, on LP-based approaches that really draw strongly. So it's, it's from the last paper here that two co-authors of mine, Fabrizio Grandoni and Christos Kalaitzis, but it really draws strongly from previous results by Atishvili and, and Fiorini, Gross, Koenemann and Sanita. So those are all, so a combination of, of the work that... This, yeah, this is, it's APX, it's a good point. Yeah, I should have mentioned that too. Those problems are APX hard. So even the, let's say, unweighted tab, which of course is a special case. Kind of, of all the, the, but the lower bound, no, it's, it's, uh, the, the former, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, I should repeat it. <laughs> I, I, should I repeat it? You want to, yeah. I, I'm happy to repeat your question. <laughs> Wonderful. Let me repeat that question of, uh, of our chair. So the, um, the question is that, so first is the lower bound, and second, uh, if there is a lower bound, is it more like 1.01 or 1.1? So the first answer is yes, and the second one is the former. So, so the, the lower bound is more like 1.01. I mean, I'm not sure about precise bound, it's pretty, pretty precisely 1.01 actually, I think, uh, which means uh, it doesn't say that much. It's one of those problems. Right? Probably the lower bound is very weak compared to what we would believe it should be, yeah. Perfect. Thanks for a question, Ola. Uh, very good. So this was uh, just tap and uh, in connectivity augmentation. Only very recently, uh, last or last year, two two years ago, was a paper by Birka Grandoni and, and Amelie that that went for first time below the factor of two. And so what I would like to talk about today is I want to show you another technique that leads to a to a factor. A significantly improved factor, at least for, for connectivity augmentation, but also for, for tab. Again, tab is just a special case of connectivity augmentation. So if, if you feel, um, uh, as I said, this is a special case for the way I defined the beginning, but if you like to think about how would the cactus look like if you start with a tree, essentially take your tree and just double the edges and then you have the cactus representing the same mean cut. So, so think of that instance when, I, when we talk about the special case, because I'm, I might get back to that special case later on and uh, uh, then I talk about cactus augmentation. Um, so, but, about, but again, I mean, the factor is of course nice, but I think what's nice also is that it actually, so those techniques that have been used over here for, and again, I should probably use the pointer, have been used over here 
they are uh, very different to what people used for TAP. Actually, here the problem got reduced to, um, uh, to a Steiner tree problem, and then the currently best Steiner tree approximation was used to, um, uh, to and then also the, to look into that approximation factor, into the, into the procedure, uh, how it works to actually obtain that factor here. Um, and so later, it's been, I think it's been a follow-up paper by Sev Nutov that showed you don't have to look into it as a black box reduction that also allows for using the Steiner tree algorithm to, to beat the factor of two, it leads to a slightly weaker factor in that one, but, um, but that would be black box. I, I'm sorry not having written that down here on the list. And, um, and so I think the contribution of the VF here is, is really most in terms of techniques. So on the one hand, we draw now from ideas that people used here in, in TAP, but, but also I think it, it should um, uh, give a somewhat different view on the problem. And we hope that hopefully this will also help in the future to, um, uh, for researchers interested in that problem or, or similar problems. But let's, uh, let's see, I, I guess time will tell. So let me give the overview. So that's essentially my uh, main task of this first half of the talk, giving this overview and saying a bit more about it. Um, so there are three steps in that, in, in that procedure. The very first step is actually a reduction to a simpler type of instance. So we already started with oh, a general instance. It's the same as cactus augmentation. I want to say, oh, actually, cactus augmentation is essentially the same as something even simpler. Namely, you can assume that your underlying graph is what we call k-white. Let me just explain to you what that means. So here's an instance. For me, we, we call an instance k-white if there's a vertex, let's call it the center. And if I remove that vertex, then the instance will break into, into smaller parts. So sometimes I like to think of it as, uh, uh, let's go for pink, I like to think of it as they're like principal subcacti hanging off that center vertex, like three of them here. So I include the center vertex in those, in those uh, in those problems that you obtain by, by essentially first removing the center. Um, and so in each one of them, we want that the number of degree two vertices is at most K. And whenever I talk about, uh, talk about K wide or use K somewhere, I think of K as being a constant actually. So otherwise this wouldn't say much, right? Because you could just pack your original instance in one of those principal sub cacti and they wouldn't really change much. So, so what is the precise statement you see it over here? The statement says it's a black box reduction. Let's assume you have an alpha approximation for, for K wide instances for constant K. Then it turns out you, this immediately transforms into an alpha plus one over square root of k approximation for general instances. So think of it a bit differently. So let's assume you, you, you wanna, um, you're willing to lose an, an, an epsilon in terms of the approximation factor when you, go, uh, when you deal with k wide instances and want to go to, uh, to general ones. Then you have to choose um, k in the order of one over epsilon square. So if you have an algorithm that is, that is an, uh, an alpha approximation for k by instances for k in the order of one over epsilon square, square? No, please. It's the same as uh, Oh, no, it isn't. Yeah, good point. It isn't. But thanks for the question. Yeah. So that's some, uh, indeed. So actually, this k white, um, a similar approach has been used in TAP. There also k was used to be tried to stick to that. But then, uh, of course, it, it's a little bit of, a bit of danger for uh, ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Of that ambiguity here. The good thing is that now, so we only talk about, they'll only talk about cactus augmentation from, uh, from now on. So this essentially means that uh, you always augment from two to three edge connected. So, so please forget about the K as, as, as its role in terms of connectivity. From now on, K is really just that because I always work with cacti. So there's no original K left, but that is a very good point. Yeah. Okay, so that's, um, uh, so long story short, if you're able to deal with k one instances for any constant K, then, I mean, deal means you have an approximation factor for that. So typically, you should think of those as, as the, um, uh, the running time will depend on k, right? It will depend probably exponentially on k, but the factor shouldn't, right? In that case, you will get the same factor up to a small error for general instances. Good. And so that's now uh, what we do. So from now on, we just look at k-wide instances. Again, k, think of it as a constant, and we will actually provide two uh, procedures, two what we call backbone procedures because they are um, uh, the backbone of what happens later. And uh, so one of them will be the procedure A is gonna, um, can I do it this way maybe? The procedure A is gonna provide a guarantee of type uh, that the, it returns a solution whose cost is bounded by the, um, uh, uh, by the cost of opt in the following way. And it depends on, on link types. So we think on, when we have a k instance, we think about that there are two types of links. 
so later to be maybe improve even more, we actually think of three types, but for the time being, let's just think about two. Namely, remember the principal subcacti I showed beforehand? So there are either links that connect vertices that are in different principal subcacti, we call them cross links, so they go across the different subcacti, or links that are within, have both endpoints within the same subcactus. And we will think of them, we will call them in links because they're inside the same subcactus. So here's shown in red and blue, red ones are cross links, blue ones are in links. And so the procedure will actually, the first one will provide a solution that whose cost, and cost is really just, so it turns out why, why do I write cost here? We said we don't have a, a cost instance. So you can think of cost as being just a cardinality, the number of links we add, but it turns out that those procedures here actually even work in the weighted case. So the only reason why the whole thing doesn't work in a weighted case is that the reduction on top doesn't work out for the weighted case. So from now, I, I don't want to restrict to the unweighted case in this, in this part because you, you really don't need it. You can just solve the weighted case here. So here, even with, with costs on the links, you get a solution whose cost is no more than the cost that, of the, that opt has in terms of in links. So the cost of the in links that opt chooses plus twice the cost of the cross links that opt chooses. So these... And... So these backbone procedures run exponentially in K at the time. Yeah, so the, the backbone procedures here, the, um, uh, the first one runs exponentially in K. It turns out the second one not. Okay. Yeah. yeah, good point, yeah. So um, there's one more thing I want to say. Exactly, so in TAP, this is very, so, so far, if you see it, look at this overview here, this could just have been uh, a talk you might have heard two years ago about TAB, actually. So there used to be very similar approaches, but there's quite a couple of technicalities to be overcome, and I will highlight that later on. So it's really different in terms you have to realize it, and that's also the reason why people went for the signer tree approach and didn't just try to extend the TAB approaches for the first procedure that beat the factor of two. But nevertheless, uh, the idea is really inspired by what people did previously in TAB, and those that want to give proper credit to, uh, to those people, of course. And then, so if you look at that, maybe we should first, let's just stop here first, what I explained here. If you look at these two procedures, then you already have a 1.5 approximation. Because if you return the better of the two, I mean, you can just think of, take the two inequalities and just mix them half-half, right? So then you get, a, you get the, the solution whose cost is no more than 1.5 of the total cost of opt. So this gives 1.5 for k-wide, for, for constant-wide, and because of the reduction on top, you would get a 1.5 plus epsilon approximation, because you lose a small epsilon because of that reduction. Right. But um, so essentially here, I think substantially improve. And then there's what I claim to be get below even 1.4. And this is due to, <coughs> sorry, due to an improvement of the um, uh, procedure A um, by, by using actually a procedure that has been used, again, has been used in tab already to some extent, but we have a much better way to analyze it. So I'll mostly focus on the first parts. I think the last one is, um, is maybe a bit less, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's very interesting, but I just don't have the time to get into it. But um, uh, And also the first two already give you the one to five factors. So I think it's, uh, it's exciting to get up to that point already. Yes. Please. So is the backbone procedure for k-wide Yes, yeah. So the question is whether the backbone procedure um, is also with respect to the, um, uh, for k by trees, right? So for, for the tap setting, but that is also with respect to the, to the LP. Yes, you can do it with respect to the, to the LP indeed. Yeah. Actually, it's a bit of a, of a, yeah, of a funny thing because I mean, it's based on, on equivalence of optimization separation, one of them. So, uh, I mean, one, one builds, one can, one can build up an LP that has the required constraints, but essentially to, to separate that LP, you use the equivalence between optimization and separation. And not that, no, a good point. Yeah, not the natural LP. Yes, this is not this is not huge natural exactly. So also maybe it's good to know that even for tab, the natural LP has an integrality gap of at least one point five. So we actually beat that here. So um, so we did something needs to happen beyond the natural LP. Indeed. But but you're but but indeed up to that point here, it could be of course we only get one point five. So maybe one could also get that factor with the natural LP. But but we don't. So we we don't have any implications on the natural LP with our approach. Yeah. Please, yeah, sure. Sorry. Uh, see, that's that's a kind of a funny. It's it's a it's a funny um uh, question because see if you have an integrality gap example. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, I should repeat. Uh, thanks, Daniel. So, question is whether the integrality gap examples are not k white. But the thing is that see when you have any integrality gap example, it is a fixed instance. So so it has 
by definition constant size, and then I can just pack it in one of those k by trees. So, so I'm uh, so I can claim they're k wide or for k large enough and k constant. Yeah, a good point. Perfect. So I'm uh, yes, I think I'm ready for the next slide. Um, so let's start with the first part reduction to to k wide instances, and uh, and so the, what we actually do is we use the round or cut. Uh, approach as a approach has been used in a variety of contexts. Let me give you a very high level explanation. So uh, essentially think of the following setting. So you have you have a rounding procedure that uh, it takes a point on, so you have values on the links that are between zero and one and think of them maybe as being a solution to an LP and you have a rounding procedure and the rounding procedure will work out if that point will be good, if that point has certain properties. But the problem is that we are not able to to make sure that the properties are provided in the LP upfront, we're not able to maybe maybe guarantee to, to find an LP that that um, uh, that will make sure the properties are are for sure provided. We can only we'll only see it during the rounding procedure whether the properties are fulfilled or not. If you are in that setting, round or cut is a wonderful technique. What it does is uh, is the following. Let's just start with a point, uh, some point maybe even of of a, of a trivial LP. So this is probably super weak. And now let's think about using the ellipsoid method. So here, you see the the polytope. This polytope. You think of this as being the the, the convex hull of incidence vectors of of cactus augmentation, just to have a picture in mind. So this is the one you want to hit. But then maybe if you're optimizing so more precisely. You can we also have an objective. But for the time being, think of it as mostly just trying to get to the polytope. And let's just apply the rounding procedure, nevertheless, even though we we kind of of know that that point probably doesn't have the right properties. Then if it succeeds. And so what we can do is if you apply it, we can check when it gives a solution and we can compare its value against the, uh, against the LP value. And if the gap is not too large, we know it, it succeeded. And then of course we can just return a solution. And if not, that procedure actually returns a reason why it failed, why the rounding procedure failed. And that reason can be captured in terms of a separating hyperplane. And so in that case, we just use the separating hyperplane in the Lipset method and keep going with the iteration of the Lipset method. So we'll get a new point, ellipsoid gives us a new point, and then we do again the rounding procedure and keep going. Because ellipsoid runs in, in polynomial time, the number of iterations here will be polynomial until at some point the rounding procedure is going to work out. And so let's assume maybe in you know, a second iteration, we didn't want to create too many slides, let's assume now it works out, and we round it to a solution, and, uh, and that's it. So that's the idea. So how precisely does that uh, or does it work the drowning procedure? So what we're gonna do is we start with a with a connectivity augmentation instance, and we actually first split it. So we create smaller sub instances that are um, each of them being k wide, and then we apply. So remember, we're given an alpha approximation only for k wide. So I, I mean, if I want to call the oracle because it's a black box reduction, I can I cannot look into it. I have to call it with k wide instances. So I somehow have to get to k wide. Um, okay, but sub instances here. So we do this through a, sl a splitting procedure. Then we apply the alpha approximation for to each one of them, and for each one of them, it may succeed or it may fail. If it fails for one of them, we will actually retrieve a separating hyperplane and just stop right away, go back to this ellipsoid method, I mean, to the round or cut and, and separate and keep going. And if it succeeds for all of them, we will then merge the solutions and return the the merged solution. Mm -hmm. um, so splitting. It's also inspired by, by TAP. So let me just do a, explain a basic splitting step. So you assume you're given an instance here. And uh, so you've, you've now values on the links. So think of an, if an, like an LP solution. So what we do is we have a so splitting operation splits at a two cut, so the min cut of the cactus. You see one such cut here. And splitting means that we create two instances, one where we contract one of the two sides. Maybe I should highlight that very briefly. So here we contracted. So this vertex here actually just consists of everything over here, got contracted into a single vertex. So this goes down to that setting. And the other one contracts the other side. So here we contracted the other side of the cut into a single vertex. Then one, we, we try to find, we will find solutions for the problems down there and, and try to somehow combine them into global solution. But now let me tell you a few challenges. Maybe before I talk about the challenges, let's just first observe something basic. Um, so nothing comes for free, right? So if you, if you split that instance, you see that links here that cross the cut appear, of course, twice. The blue ones, they appear on both sides. So you increase the LP value, right? So if you want to split, you typically want to split on a cut where you have very, what we call a light cut, where you have a little small value on the, on the cut. So you don't want to split on, on, a, on a cut with a lot of LP value because you're doubling it. 
and you, you don't want to split too often. So what is the what is the challenge? Uh, just a, a basic challenge with a splitting procedure. So I said, oh, let's just solve the sub instances and then, then merge them together into um, the solutions together. So in TAP, that was really nice. People, it isn't TAP2, this approach that goes back to David Achashvili. It's a beautiful, a beautiful idea that was created in, in the context of TAP. And the cool thing in TAP is if you do a splitting, so you have a tree, you have an edge and you split the tree at that edge, then each min cut is either on one side or on the other side. But that's not true here. So here, if you do a splitting, and then you say you have solutions for each of the two sub instances. Now, just take the so assume you just take the union of them on the original instance. Then it can happen that there's a cut that's not going to be covered because cuts can go across the instance. That's that doesn't happen in tap. That only happens in cactus augmentation, right? And so here, what we show is that actually, so this of course can happen, but we can fix it, and we can fix it by adding even more links to the solution. Uh, but the number of those links is bounded, and it's bounded by, um, so pick any of the two sub-instances, let's say this one here, here's the, the, the contracted vertex, and here we picked three links, so it's bounded by this degree, by here by three, you need at most three additional links at the end to add to your solution to fix those cuts that you, you may have missed by merging. So somehow you want to find a solution to those uh, sub-instances up here, at least one of them, where that degree is small. And we, we show this can actually be done. So if a cut is light, we can either find a solution that can be merged cheaply, so it, it has such a small degree, or we can show that actually there's a problem with the, with the point with which we started, with the LP point, and we can find a separating hyperplane. And again, we, we stop, we go back to the ellipsoid, we cut, uh, we cut it off, we keep going. So I'll just give a quick summary of that, of that procedure. So, so, so far, I said we can split. I just explained splitting on a high level. So when I split a light cut, and we want to, uh, we have to watch out how we merge. But also, one problem is there may not be that many light cuts. So many cuts may be heavy. So heavy sounds somehow good, because it seems like the LP is over covering a cut. So it should be easy to kind of cover that cut if the LP is happy to spend a large, a large amount on a cut. And so what we show is that one can actually indeed reduce to the case where all the cuts are light. So you can first, before we start, with all the split, with any of the splitting, we can first find a set of links that's very cheap and covers all of the heavy cuts. There's also an idea that comes from tap here. It's, uh, it, it's much, much more interesting to realize this actually this reduces to the rectangle hitting problem. That, um, and we, we show that there's a, a constant integrality gap for, um, for the problem that, that then leads to a, to, a, to a cheap way to cover all heavy cuts. So we, we first choose those links, we fix them, then the instance gets reduced to a residual one that, is, that doesn't have any heavy cuts anymore. And then we can split anywhere we want. And of course, you still need a good splitting um, uh, protocol, how we split to make sure we get k-wide instances. And we don't split too often, right? Because we don't want to double too many links. But that's possible. And so I don't go into these details again. It's one of the things I'm, I'm skipping. Yes, just crossing. You guessed that is that when you find your thing you're saying that you guess that this crossing is cut and then recurse. That's exactly. Essentially, you can, exactly. So from the merging step before, you can first start by guessing the ones, exactly, and then, and then keep going. Yeah. Yeah, good point. So then you should not, I mean, how many cuts do you do in total? What do you mean, how many cuts do you do in total? In order to find a K-wide, how many cuts do you find in total? Ah, I see. Oh, to, to get to, down to K-wide. So what we do is we take the original instance and we, we split off um, so a part of it to say that the very, so if, if, if we fix one word, it's called the root. And we go as far out as we can to, to split. And what does it mean? So we split at a, at, a, at a light cut, but we have to make sure that we can amortize against the doubling that happens here. So make sure that the stuff you split off that is an, on the non-root part has total links inside there that is much larger than the links that cross. Okay, and so this amortizes. No, the guessing, no, no, exactly. This is not recursive. I thought you were talking about, no, this, this is not recursive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good. So we split into K white. Then uh, for each K white instance, we, we do, we find solutions that are cheaply mergeable. Or if this fails, we get a uh, separating hyperplane, which we then use, of course, to go into the Lipson method. And, and that's precisely what happens. So either we merge if things succeed or we separate if they fail and we keep going. And I'm soon running out of time, so let me just hear, do hear the overview. So I have a few more slides about the stack analysis, but let me skip them. Let me just um, uh, stop here and again mention. So I explained very briefly the reduction now to um, uh, to K white, 
Um, oh, actually, I do have a few things about the backbone procedure that I probably should say before Vera starting. Yeah, maybe should. Okay, yeah, yeah, Vera tells me I should do that. So let me, let me, let, let, <laughs> and she's typically uh, right. So let me, let me do that then. Um, let me talk a little bit about the backbone procedures. Um, so I just talked about the k wide reduction. Um, so it's quick, uh, it's rather pain free. Uh, so there's um, those two procedures. Let me repeat it again. The in link procedure that, that um, uh, where you pay, you lose a factor of two on the cross links. And the other one, which we call the, the cross link algorithm or cross -link, cross link procedure, that is good on the cross links, but bad on the in links. So, and then we get the three over two, as I explained already on, on the overview slide. Um, so, let me talk bri very briefly about the in link procedure because it's really easy to see and also explains nicely. So, why, why do we care about KY, right? So, I'll spend a lot of time talking, I spend all my time essentially talking about, about why, how to get to KY, but I didn't tell you why we want to get there. Um, the reason is that essentially this statement down here it turns out if you have a cactus augmentation instance with constantly many terminals, constantly many degree two vertices, then you can solve it efficiently through a dynamic programming procedure. And this loses some nice results that people used in, in fixed parameter tractability, where they reduced the problem to a sinatry problem. This is a sinatry problem with constantly many terminals. Of course, they're well known to be solved, that you can solve them in, in polynomial time. And, and so this means that for each principal sub cactus we have here, um, for example, this one here, if you only had this instance, only this part of the instance, you can solve it exactly. So somehow you've actually a whole bunch of easy instances that are interconnected by a single vertex. That's what KY means. And so what the in-link procedure does is something really simple. It just looks on at each of those principal subcacti independently. Let's look at the first one and just computes an optimal solution just for the min cuts in there. Then it does the same for the next one. It does the same for the next one. And it takes the union of all of them, and that will definitely be a solution. And it will have that guarantee because those solutions, I will get the best one for each single principal sub cactus, but I could have got one option for a solution is, of course, just take opt, take all the opt links that have at least one endpoint in the current principal sub cactus you consider. Let's assume you find a solution for that one. Take all the opt links that have at least one endpoint in there. And if you do that, you, of course, use every opt link that is a cross link, use it twice. Because it appears on two in two principal sub cacti, but the inlinks you only lose once, uh, use once, and this gives precisely that guarantee. So that's the reason why KY is so important. And I want to talk very briefly about the crosslink algorithm and then pass it to, to Vera. So, um, so let's just first think about the tab instance, what the easier setting. So here, this is the natural LP. Just for each cut, you want to have one unit of LP value crossing. And it turns out this is beautiful result by, so as I mentioned by Fiorini, Gross, Koenemann, and Sanitad, it shows that if you add 0, 1 half Schwartalgo Mori cuts, then actually get an LP that has exponentially many constraints or exponentially many such cuts, but you can, you can separate over them in polynomial time. And moreover, any solution to that LP you see here can be rounded efficiently then to, uh, to a solution of, um, uh, of value at most twice the LP value on the in-links plus once the cross-links. And so what we will do is, so we would like to do the same. Of course, I mean, the, the obvious approach would be let's do the same for cap. Let's just introduce, or for cactus augmentation, let's introduce those cuts and just separate. But first, we actually don't even know whether you can separate over them efficiently. Uh, so that's, that's maybe the main issue. And But what we can show is that there will be um, uh, some magic laminar family of cuts, of min cuts, such that we only need the 0, 1 half Shotalgo Mori cuts with respect to that laminar family. And so that then separation reduces to the tap case. So we will say more about that in a short moment. And it turns out that that is good enough. So if you have, you can actually ignore all the min cuts except for a laminar family, introduce those, those stronger Shvatalgomori cuts only for the laminar family. And uh, that's enough to obtain the same guarantee we had before for tap. Of course, the big question is how, why does this magic laminar family exist and how do you find it? And that's what, Vera's so going to talk about. And now I think I will definitely stop and not talk about the stack analysis. Let me just switch right away to Vera slides. And uh, here we go.
Um, okay, so this second part of this talk will be um, basically about the second backbone procedure. So I'm basically going to talk only about how we get this, this procedure bait B here. Um, so we are again looking at an instance of cactus augmentation. So we have this, this graph where we have like every edge is contained in precisely one cycle. And we uh, distinguish again between these inlinks that are within one principal subcactus hanging off the center, and we have the crosslinks that go in between. And what we want to get is a procedure that pays it may loses at most the fact to two on the inlinks. So we are fine with that, but we want to be exact basically on the on the crosslinks. So we don't want to lose anything um, on those uh, red links here that go between two bit different principal subcheck day. And so in this, so we could just briefly talk about this and he showed you kind of some, some LP based statement here. We'll just like to keep things simple a bit, just talk about, um, I will just prove things basically with respect to comparing against opt. One can also make things LP based, but just to keep things a bit uh, simpler for this talk. And well, this one other thing I should say is, well, the statement here has costs because it's really not gonna be important here that things are unweighted. So I will also talk really about the weighted version here. And also it's not gonna be important that, that we are k wide or anything that was just like needed for that backbone procedure A. So we we'll really just look at any arbitrary instance of cactus augmentation with some center and we wanna have a procedure that's, that's basically good if we have many cross links. So that's, going to be the purpose of what I want to show you here. And so first of all, I should say like such a statement like this that we want to achieve here in this crosslink algorithm that had already been shown in a setting of tree augmentation by Friorini, Gross, Kuhnemann, and Sanita. So that's the statement that Rico also mentioned before. Uh, so the way they showed this result is they basically showed like the main theorem they showed was that they showed that if the instance has only links that are cross links and when what we call uplinks, then the instance is, is flowable in polynomial time. So what is an uplink? Well, an uplink is just a link, like these green links here in the, in the bottom picture, where one of the endpoint, where for every, for every of these green links, these uplinks, one endpoint of the link is an ancestor of the other one in that tree. So here, like for this, Green link here, like this vertex here, is an ancestor of the other endpoint. And the same holds for these other two green uplinks here. And so if you have that result, uh, you immediately get that cross link algorithm because you can basically look at any uh, in link in your instance, like this blue one here at the bottom, and you can just split it into two uplinks that cover the same edges. Like here, we split that one blue in link into two. Uh, uplinks, uh, this loses a factor two, and we end up with an instance that has only crosslinks and uplinks, and that one we can solve efficiently. And that immediately gives us that guarantee that we want to have. So this is how Fiorini, Gross, and Kuhnemann and Sanita uh, gave their crosslink algorithm for TAP. And so I want to show you how we can do that thing for connectivity augmentation. And we will use their statement here about TAP actually as a black box in our algorithm. And so we'll, this will come up later on. And the kind of question is, if we have this cactus zero, how do we find sort of the right tap instance in there? Because there's really no tree there or anything. Um, so let me start with something very basic first. So let me show you a very simple way of getting a true approximation for cactus augmentation. Uh, so here's one way of doing that. So if you look at this standard LP here, which is just like the natural LP, I have a variable for every link. I want to minimize the total cost. And as constraints, I just say, well, I want to cover every min cut, so every graph containing exactly, every cut exa con uh, containing exactly two edges of my cactus. I just want to cover all these cuts. And this gives me an LP relaxation. Now, what I can do is I can sort of bidirect um, every link. So I just replace it by two links going in opposite directions. And then I just say, well, so I denote these, these directed links by this L versus arrow on top of it. And then I say, well, look at the cut and I always represent cuts by 
by edge sets that don't contain that centi. Then I just say, I only count a link as covering this cat if it's ingoing in that set. And so this way I might need to buy both directions of every link in my solution. Um, so I'm losing a factor too. But the nice thing is that one can show that this LP is actually integral. So this will actually have an integral solution. And so let me show you. Um, basically, okay, so the question was really, it is easy to show that this is integral. Um, I, will, I will show you one, one, one proof uh, in a moment. One way to show it is to say, to do uncrossing to see that uh, a vertex is defined by a laminar family of cuts. And then you can show like if you restrict to those inequalities defining that vertex, that's gonna give you a TU matrix and you're done. Um, one different way of how you can show this is, and this is gonna be useful in the following, is um, via a primal dual approach. And so let us first like let me show you the, the dual LP of that. So in the primal LP, we have variables corresponding to this directed links. And then the dual LP variables correspond um, to these cats. And as mentioned, I represent them always by edge sets, uh, by vertex sets um, that do not contain the center vertex here. And the dual constraints just say that if I look at a single, single link, then sort of the, 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 edge, the, the cuts that are entered by that link uh, should have total weight at most the cost of the link. So we have such kind of cut packing constraints um, in the dual. So this is the dual LP. And one way of, uh, compute, uh, of computing an optimal primal and dual solution, and also one way of proving integrality of uh, this LP is using a uh, like standard primal dual algorithm. And let me go over that because that's actually gonna be uh, somewhat useful uh, later on uh, to, to look at really this primal dual algorithm. So what does this primal dual algorithm do? So you can think of this as a kind of continuous process where we always maintain during the algorithm uh, some dual solution yt. So at any time t, we have a feasible dual solution yt that might not be optimal initially at zero and it will uh, change over the time but it will always be feasible. And then we denote by ft just the set of links uh, for which the corresponding dual constraint is tight. So this is, this is exactly those links ft for which this constraint here is fulfilled with equality. And what the primal dual algorithm does um, is we're starting with a vector with, that is like with the dual feasible dual solution just y being zero. And then at any time t, we increase those dual variables uh, that correspond to inclusion with minimal uh, sets. Uh, so inclusion with minimal dual variables um, that are not already uh, that we can still increase so that are not already covered by this set ft of edges corresponding to a tight cut. So initially this would be just the singleton cuts corresponding to the terminals. And then, okay, so this cuts, the, we increase these dual variables at some point, maybe this red edge here becomes tight, then this, this dual constraint here cannot go any further and so on. And then we'll grow later on. Maybe these variables are now the active ones that grow when these, all these red edges became tight and so on. And one can uh, show that uh, like, as shown in this picture, the variables that, that are like growing, they will always correspond to really disjoint sets. So they, these sets that are growing here, these blue sets, they cannot be in, intersecting in any way. And so really one thing that is important here is that primal dual algorithm will compute a dual solution with laminar support. So we know none of these sets are somehow intersecting. Um, but we will actually later on use more properties of the dual solution. So we are not just interested in getting any dual solution with laminar support because that we could have done differently. And so this is like the first phase of the primal dual algorithm where we just continuously like over time grow these, these sets until at some point just uh, all the cuts will be covered by FT. So at some point just nothing can grow and then we can stop. At some point just nothing is gonna happen anymore. And then in the primal dual algorithm, you always have also like a second step 
uh, which is called the cleanup step. That's not going to be super relevant for this talk because we will be mostly interested in the dual solution actually. But what this cleanup step does is just you consider the links in the set FT. So FT is always at the end of this algorithm, it's going to be a feasible solution because every cut um, is covered. Otherwise, the dual variables would still continue to grow. Um, so we consider, so all, all the things we, so we have a feasible solution. And then in this cleanup step, we just throw out some links that we don't need anymore. Namely, we go with the links <laughs> in the reverse order in which they were added to FT. And just, if we don't need, we just check whether we can throw out the link and still have feasible solution. If that's the case, we just drop the link and that's it. Um, so as mentioned, the second step, it's not super important to understand that here in detail for this talk because really it doesn't affect the, the dual solution that we, and, that, and this is what we mostly care about. Um, so what one can show using like this standard analysis of primal dual algorithms is that at the end of this algorithm, we indeed have computed an optimal primal solution F to this bidirected LP, uh, so an integral one. So we really have an edge set, a link set there, and we have an optimal dual solution Y. And so this is one another way of showing integrality of this um, LP. Maybe it's not the, the most simple one, but it's going to be a somewhat useful perspective that we'll see uh, in a moment. Yes. Uh, okay, so the question was whether really it's possible to interpret this as a discrete process. So of, so, of course, I mean, if you would like to implement that thing, you can just see that basically things will just increase as long as, I mean, there is few kind of discrete events where something happens, and I mean, that's when an edge becomes tight, so you don't really have to, uh, you can implement that in terms of like discrete steps, but it's kind of useful to think about this as a continuous process. But anyways, in the end, we really don't need to run that algorithm. It's just going to turn out like a useful view on, of understanding what's going on here. Um, good. Uh, yeah. OK, so then uh, let's actually get to, to why is this, why I'm telling you all this stuff about this uh, primal dual method. So, so far, only like standard things basically happened. So here is how we how we want to get uh, to our guarantee that we want to get in our crosslink algorithm. So suppose we know the the, the crosslinks that are part of up. So suppose we knew up cross. So this is if we knew that we could actually use that primal dual algorithm. That's the idea to complete these crosslinks uh, to a solution um, that has precisely the cost that we want to have. So we are, if we have the, these, these crosslinks in, so that are part of opt, then we can use the dual algorithm. So we look at the residual instance, which basically asks to find a set F of links that completes these crosslinks to a solution. Or equivalently, we could say, find a set of links that covers all these, these, these min cuts of the cactus that are not already covered by these crosslinks uh, in opt cross. And, and then just run the primal dual algorithm to cover those crosslinks, those cuts that are not already covered. And because this primal dual thing uh, gave us sort of a two approximation, you end up with losing a factor two on everything except for these crosslinks and up cross. So if we knew up cross, uh, things would be easy. I mean, that thing is, uh, this is sort of maybe a trivial observation, but though here is like, uh, one nice thing um, why this primal dual algorithm is now relevant, namely if we think about what happens if we take some crosslinks, so some, some set O of crosslinks, for example, these crosslinks from opt, and we just run this primal dual algorithm on the residual instance. Let's look at what does our primal dual algorithm going to do. And it turns out it will do almost the same as the primal dual algorithm on the original instance. The only thing that basically happens is, of course, the primal dual algorithm, like if I look at the dual solution, of course, it cannot have any weight on these red sets here in the weight, which are those red sets, these dual variables 
they correspond to cuts that don't even, they're already covered by crosslinks in R. So these dual variables don't even exist in the dual on the right. Uh, so they can of course not increase um, and can't be part of the dual solution. But really otherwise the primal dual algorithm just does the very same thing. Um, so we just get the same solution, just dropping those, those dual variables that don't, even, that don't even exist anymore. And really like here is where we really use that the set R is sort of a set of crosslinks because that means if one of these uh, sets here in our laminar family is covered by one of the crosslinks, then also all larger sets in this laminar family will be also covered uh, by the same crosslink. And this is where the fact that R is a set of crosslink come in. And really you could think of like the primal dual algorithm kind of grows these sets from the bottom and going larger and larger sets grow, grow until you, on the left, you some point you sort of hit the center and you're done. And on the left and the right, you might just at some point sort of bump into one of these crosslinks and you kind of stop early. But I can really show you like really the same thing happens. And this is kind of nice because it gives us a good understanding of how, how the cost of this completion changes when we take a set of crosslinks. And so we can show that the, if I take my primal duals, like the dual solution, um, that was uh, computed by the primal dual algorithm on the original instance, then I just know that if I restrict um, this dual solution to those cuts that are not covered by R, uh, by the set R of cross links, then this gives me an optimum dual solution for the residual instance. Okay. Um, and so now let me finally show you uh, how this actually um, helps us to get really our guarantee. So, yeah, sure. It's like this, based on statistics of or non or it should be east. So it's like this is just that they're directed so they don't interfere the sets, the edges. So should it be hard to see if you can um, I mean, this is like, you need to observe that the primal dual algorithm really does the same. It's not super hard to see, but if you want to argue it carefully, it's like not totally obvious. So you need to look at some cases and see if it is really uh, to prove it. Um, so it's not, yeah, I wouldn't say it's like obvious from here, but it's yeah, okay. not too hard to see if you just look at what could go wrong in the primal dual. Um, Good, okay. So this is like, we now understand what happens if we want the primal dual algorithm for a certain set out of crosslinks. The question is how do we find this best set out of crosslinks? Uh, so what we've shown so far is that if we have any set of crosslinks, um, then we can get a set F of links that completes O to a Kekka segmentation solution. And the cost of these, this completion will be exactly like the sum of the dual variables corresponding to cuts that are not covered by R. And this is like the true approximation for this residual instance. And so what we now do is we basically will find the best set R. Uh, so here is like the cost of, if we have a set fixed set R, the cost of our solution is just gonna be exactly this. And of course, if I choose R to be just the optimum crosslinks, and um, then I get exactly like this bound that I want to have. So if I can solve this minimization problem here on the left, then I'm done. And the nice thing is now we can solve this minimization problem using that result about tap by uh, Fiorini equals Kuhnemann and Sanita. And really the reason why this is like a tap problem is because we're here talking about a laminar family and how crosslinks cover a laminar family. So let me just briefly show you the reduction because it's in fact very simple. Um, so what we just do is in order to solve that minimization problem, we build a tap instance. And the way we build that is just, we take that set of this laminar family from the left and we just draw the tree that represents this laminar family. So we draw the tree where uh, such that the this laminar family is just are really just the one cuts of that uh, tree, and then we insert for every for each of these uh, for each of these elements of the laminar family, and they correspond to the edges of the tree, and I just uh, insert uh, one 
uplink or an uplink here, these are the green ones. And they have really, the cost of this uplink will just be the value of the dual, of this dual variable uh, that I got from my dual solution uh, here and of my cactus augmentation instance. And then uh, for every, every cross link that I have in my instance on the left, I can find the corresponding link here on, on the right that will also be either an uplink or a cross link. And the important property is like, if you look at this cross link here on the left, this covers these three members of my alignment family, it will cover the same on the right here. So you can find like this corresponding cross link. And now I can, I have an instance of tap that has just cross links and uplinks. Uh, and by this result, by Fiorini, Gross, Kudum, and Sanitaire, we can solve that exactly in polynomial time. And so how does the solution look like? Well, I will buy some cross links, but then that might be not a feasible solution. So I need to complement it by some of the green links. But well, which green links should I take? Well, I should just buy, I basically need to buy this one, only one reasonable option. I just buy one green link for each of the cats in my lime and family, they're not covered. And so the cost of these green links that I need to buy is exactly this expression down here. So this is just by construction because that's just the cost of the link. And so this really means like minimizing the C expression is really just like the same as solving this, this tab instance here on the right. And this is efficiently solvable by this result by Fubini, Gross, Kuhnemann and Sanita. And so this gives us um, this, that's basically one way of getting this. Um, algorithm here. Um, let me at the end just make like one remark about this. Um, so, so far I told you, okay, we take this dual solution computed by the primal dual algorithm. And of course this has this property, nice property, it's laminar, but really we know other techniques to compute dual solutions with laminar support, optimal ones. Um, and one thing I would like to point out is that it's not sufficient to take any optimal dual solution with laminar support, but really there is something special about this uh, solution computed by the primal dual algorithm. Namely, we need a certain kind of minimality. And so a minimal solution for us is just one where I basically cannot take any weight, like maybe on that red set here on the right picture and push it just downwards to some smaller set, like this green one here on the left. If that's possible, I would call a solution not minimal. And it turns out that there's actually a unique minimal optimal dual solution with laminar support. And this is the one computed by the primal dual algorithm and that's the one we need. So actually in the paper, uh, we also have a slightly different proof. We don't use that primal dual method, but we just say that why there would be this minimal optimal dual solution with laminar support and you can work with that. Um, but I think this primal dual algorithm matches kind of like it's a nice way of into way of seeing how what's going on there intuitively and matches kind of the intuition of how we came up with that proof. But this is something I really want to highlight. It's really not just about laminarity because as like in many applications where we look at just do end crossing to get some optimal dual solution with laminar support. This is really like not sufficient here. Yes. Um, okay, so the question is where we use the minimality and like basically the thing is like this lemma here, this doesn't work anymore that the restriction of Y star to, to cuts that are not covered by R is a optimal dual solution for the residual instance. This just fails if we don't have a minimal solution anymore. Um, so this is just really wrong. So it's actually easy to find count examples for that. Uh, good. Um, okay, so this was uh, like this part B of the backbone procedure and together with uh, all the other stuff Rico was talking about and the stack analysis that we skipped all together, uh, we got this, get this 1.393 approximation for connectivity augmentation. Let me like conclude with like some open questions. So one question is, can we improve the approximation Factor 30. So in particular, one should say like this 1.393 is really not the right number to get to you. Like even our algorithm is for sure not tight. Um, so getting like the right analysis there uh, to analyze that or maybe some different algorithm that does something better. Your analysis of your algorithm stuff. No. You don't believe your analysis is 
we are, I think we are very sure that the analysis of, our, of the, the last page, the stack analysis that we didn't talk about, that's for sure not tight. What is, like, uh, like what is your guess? What is like, what should be like the right number? Yeah, that's a very good question. We don't really know, even for our algorithm, we don't have like, very good bad examples, like where it's not good. So we really don't have any good guess of what the right What's number could be. Okay. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so Rico is suggesting four thirds, but we are, yeah, we are not really sure about what the right number is, but that one is certainly not the right number. Um, so that's the one question. And the other question is, of course, can we do something better than two in the weighted setting? Uh, so here we could now like sort of transfer all the machinery from tab to, to connectivity augmentation. And like in the weighted setting, we could recently beat the factor two for, for the tree augmentation. So there we got, uh, 1.5 plus epsilon approximation, uh, but it's still open to beat the factor two for weighted connectivity augmentation. So that's a nice open question. Yeah, thank you. Okay.